coming along. So I'm going to talk about the Lecklenbrook project. Um, Realise people are attending from all over Oxfordshire. You might not know where Lecklenbrook is, so I'll give you a bit of background on the brook, um, where it is, the main issues, its status, a little bit on what we've been up to as a project, um, and then some advice on who could help you if you wanted to set up a similar project, uh, permissions, responsibilities, possible projects, possible sources of funding. So hopefully it'd be useful if you're thinking you would like to do similar. So can you just let me know, Rizal, can everyone see that okay? Yes, yeah, I think cool. you, um, I can see it anyway. Great, right, let's, uh, let's go then. Okay. Okay, so Lecton Brook is, um, there's 12 kilometres there, I've read recently, it's actually 13 kilometres and it's a, a chalk stream and it's one of only 225 in the world, most of which are in southern England. Um, so you could describe it as rarer than a rainforest, it's certainly very precious, uh, they support some very rare and specialised species and are certainly worthy of preserving and looking after. So on the map there, um, I hope you can see my cursor. Letcombe Brook comes out of the chalk at the very bottom of the picture there where you can just see Letcombe coming off the bottom of the page. That's Letcombe Bassett. There's a spring that arises in Bassett, another one in Letcombe Regis, and then it flows sort of north, northeast, down through, right through the middle of Wantage, right through the middle of Grove, out through between the Hannies, and then joins the Childry Brook just before Childry Brook joins the Ock. So it's the part of the Ock catchment. Um, it starts off as a, as a true chalk stream, as I said, coming out of the chalk. By the time it's down sort of north of Hanny, it's not quite so classic chalk stream. Anyone who knows the Hannies will know they're, they're pretty flat and, and clay soils. But the brook does still have a nice um, gravel bed and still looks very much like a chalk stream for most of its length. So as I said, it supports some quite rare species. Um, otters are very active on the brook at the moment. We were first aware of them from about 2008, 2009. Um, we had the first otter cubs this year that we were aware of. We still have a good population of water vole, which are obviously declining, uh, our fastest declining mammal actually in the UK, but no doubt partly due to Bee Bout's water vole project, they're actually doing okay on the Letcombe Brook. Uh, supports a nice population of wild brown trout too. But I think what a lot of people forget is that um, rivers of all sorts and most water bodies are just such important wildlife corridors for so many species. Um, or pit stops for so many species. So we really need to remember that. And Letcombe Brook also provides a really important green space corridor for people running through all those different communities and linking them up as such. So um, I think uh, Kes mentioned the, the most recent uh, analysis information on our rivers. And you can analyze the data for your river by going to the Catchment Data Explorer, which is available on the EA website. If you literally Google that, um, you should be able to drill in, find your river and have a look at the data for your river. And it has just been updated. And as Kess said, uh, <laughs> all of our, our rivers failed basically. Letcombe Brook was failing just on the ecological status because it was poor for fish and it was thought that was due to blockages to fish passage along the river. It is now also failing on chemical standards. As you can see 2016 it said good and now 2019 it says fail and as Kess mentioned part of that is because they're now testing for additional things which is a good thing, you know, it's good. We're getting the, good, the full picture. So some other data that came out recently, which is also well worth a look at your local situation is this um, 
Rivers Trust map, uh, is my river fit to swim in? And the Guardian publicised this recently. And as you can read there, uh, the information revealed 1.5 million hours of raw sewage going into our rivers via storm overflows in 2019. That's the most recent data that was available. Uh, so that is an awful lot of untreated sewage. And I think the big issue and the reason that it's hit the headline so much is that if you read the water company information, we will think that we flush the toilet, it goes to the sewage treatment farm and uh, it comes out as clean as the river that it's discharged into. And um, nobody had really pointed out that that isn't quite the fact because quite a lot of the sewage doesn't get treated at all because of these issues with storm overflow. Um, this sort of discharge is only supposed to take place in exceptional circumstances, but that isn't the case. A lot of sewage treatment works and the water company's um, infrastructure is so poor that pipes are porous, groundwater seeps into them and all that extra groundwater is going through the system. The sewage treatment works are overloaded and um, we can't, can't treat it all. So it's you know, then discharging that additional water mixed with raw sewage into the river. So it is a big issue. So do have a look at your local map. You can drill in and find your nearest sewage treatment works. So we actually got really lucky. This is the Wanted Sewage Treatment Works, which is located between Grove and Hanny. And you can see on there, it says that uh, the overflow spilled 73 times for a total of 194 hours. Um, some sewage treatment works were flowing, overflowing for thousands of hours. One in West Oxfordshire was overflowing for five months continuously. And if you want to find out a bit more about that, I'd advise you to go and have a look at the WASP website, Windrush Against Sewage Pollution. They've been uh, finding out some very interesting stuff. So anyway, back to the background on the brook. Um, got some nice pictures of fish there, which I'm vaguely obsessed by. Um, brown trout, bullhead, they're the main, main species. We do have stone loach as well. And we certainly used to have brook lamprey and I'm still desperate to find one and uh, be able to evidence that they are still present, present in the brook. So fingers crossed, but I haven't managed it yet. But lots of other wildlife too, as I've mentioned, water voles. Uh, kingfishers are regularly seen through all the, the villages and towns on the brook. And I recently found a, a dead water shrew as well, which we know a lot less about. Um, we don't really know where they are a lot of the time because they're just a lot less evident than many species. There's a, a picture of the brook which is actually taken from the Iron Bridge at um, East Hanny, view downstream. As you can see, it's sort of classic chalk stream with a nice gravel bed. You can see there's nice green patches of ranunculus, nice lush uh, riparian vegetation on the banks with falls watercress or, or true watercress, rushes and reeds, um, you know, all, all sorts of that, that nice marginal vegetation. And that's what provides that great habitat for so many species, food for water voles, cover for fish, all the rest of it. So that's, that's what we're aiming for <laughs> in a way. But a lot of the brook doesn't look like that. Here's some other views. So picture on the left is a, a massive dam, which is actually on the Beebout Reserve, uh, which is between Letcombe Regis and Letcombe Bassett. It's over two metres tall and it impounds the river, um, which at that stage forms a massive lake, which has two metres of silt in the bottom of it. So very much not a chalk stream for about five or 600 metres upstream of that dam. Picture on the right is, is uh, Letcombe Bassett, and that's the crest beds. Again, a, a very overwide section. It was manipulated for the manufacture of, for the, for the growing of watercress. So man-made feature, artificially widened. As soon as you widen a bit of the brook, you lose the velocity and all the silt drops out. 
So again, another massively silted up section of the brook. That's the bit on the left is where the wanted tramway used to go through. Uh, so it's, it's very narrow at that point, brick lined, very fast flowing. Uh, the new bridge that went in by Smith's Wharf, just by the Sainsbury's development in, in Wantage, which is, I don't know who designed that. I'd like to have a word with them. It's massively over wide. Um, it's horrible. You can see all the gabions. Uh, it's just full of silt underneath. Uh, no vegetation can grow. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a poor design. Uh, which on the left is through the middle of Grove. I think those houses probably went in during the 60s, I guess. I was born in Grove in 1968. My parents had been in their home a few years, so I would say 60s at some point. You can see they're just you know, concrete lined, basically, with just canalised what was a, a nice natural chalk, chalk stream, built right up to the edge of it. People have claimed as much garden as they can, and um, you've lost all that riparian habitat. All gone, no natural banks, nowhere for water voles. The kingfishers still buzz up and down it occasionally, and there are a few trout, but it's not really a river, is it? The picture on the right is also in Grove, again, just illustrating a path right on the edge of a bank, uh, artificial banks again. And lots of barriers to fish passage up and down the brook. As I said, it's only 13 kilometres long. And um, so far, I'm at 23 barriers to fish passage along that brook. And they go from quite substantial ones, like the picture on the left, which is by the health centre, Mabley Way, uh, worth a look. And um, it's a bridge that goes nowhere. So uh, I'm hoping I might be able to get that taken out. But you can see the drop, you can see um, there's a drop at the other end too into a very deep pool that's been scoured out. Uh, all sorts of stuff jams there and causes a problem. And then there are a lot of these smaller structures like the pitch on the left. P people love the waterfalls. I do appreciate the sound of running water is, is beautiful, but a waterfall like that can, excuse me, can prevent passage of fish upstream. A big trout will get out that. But coarse fish certainly won't, uh, a bullet won't, roach won't, smaller trouts, trout won't. And it also causes impoundment of the flow and silt to build up behind it. Um, you know, material can build up behind it and increase flood risk too. So ideally we'd like to remove as many obstructions as possible. Got several mills along the brook, I think there were 10 at one point. Uh, flour mills, silk mills, all sorts of things. Pitch on the left is lower mill in Hanny. Uh, Pitch on the right is the old mill in Wantage, which, which is right next to the functioning mill, which isn't actually on the brook. And that picture was taken last winter, just showing how it's impounded the flow and the water was, was spilling over. Over wide, unnatural banks, lots of habitat, lots of silt build up all the usual problems having a structure impounding the brook. But one of the big issues for Letton Brook um, when we started and, and still is lack of or poor management and sections of the brook look very much like the picture on the left where we've again lost all riparian habitat just because it's been shaded out by brambles and trees and um, you end up with a very bare gravel bed with none of the in-stream aquatic vegetation, none of the bankside vegetation. So a complete lack of shelter and food for invertebrates, fish. Uh, there are, you know, there are still trout there on, you know, but there'd be a lot more if we had some decent riparian habitat. Picture on the right is, is much the same. Again, a very, very clear, clean bed but um, a complete lack of uh, diversity of habitat. So uh, cropping right up to the water's edge, I mentioned buffers just before I got started on my presentation, there should be at least a minimum buffer. Uh, as you can see this picture was taken I think two years ago now, the farmer has now 
reinstated a buffer after I approached him about this, which I'm very pleased by. But at this point, the crop was within a, a meter of the water. So you can imagine if he's uh, dropping slug pellets or spraying nitrates or whatever else, that's pretty much going straight in the river anyway, regardless of, uh, of runoff. Poaching of the banks by livestock in the central picture and over management by basically, you know, ground, ground keepers um, mowing right up to the water's edge. And that was right over a water vole colony. Uh, you can see some of the burrows just um, sort of center bottom edge of the picture. So poor management is a big issue. So what have we been up to? What have we been able to do about it? So the, this was uh, Willow Walk, which is actually a nature reserve, uh, just as you come down the hill out of Wantage on your left. This is what it used to look like. Uh, you can <laughs> read the, uh, the captions on there. Ducks were a huge issue in Wantage. Um, this is a little while ago, it's before my time. I don't know what date that picture was taken, but this is uh, more representative of what it looks like now. That was a case of carrying out some, some habitat management and solving the duck problem. Um, we actually encouraged people to stop feeding them and, um, and it made a massive difference. All that erosion, all those bare, bare banks were down to hundreds of ducks, hundreds of mallards. Uh, there's another picture just to illustrate the problem somewhere else that's directly opposite the mill, Mill Street Vantage. That's what it did look like again, eroded banks, looked awful, big rat problem, loads of ducks that were in very poor health and full of worms, uh, lots of litter, lots of bread. And the picture on the right was after the restoration project that Letkenbrook carried out. So they did some fundraising and actually got, got the banks rebuilt and protected and planted up. And um, it's, it's helped massively. It doesn't look quite like that now. Um, but the the banks are, you know, very natural and uh, much much healthier. So just some uh, just some shots. The importance of the volunteers to the project is, is huge. We rely very much on volunteers to get anything else, anything very much done. The habitat management takes uh, a lot of elbow grease, and uh, the volunteers bring the elbows. So um, here they are. We uh, carry out risk assessments. Um, I was trained by BBOUT. I spent a few years with them and did, did my training with BBOUT. So I basically adopted their approach. And um, we get volunteers down on the riverbank. We provide the tools, carry out the risk assessment and uh, explain what we're doing and why and, and get them stuck in and we support them and encourage them. And we get lots done because of them. Is some of the uh, villains from their work, the picture on the left. Bramble was right down to the water's edge there. Uh, there was absolutely no riparian habitat at all. That picture was taken within 12 months of that work being carried out. And you can see how quickly the habitat can recover. We didn't seed that, we didn't plant that. It was all there in the seed bank and uh, it just got some light and some space and it bounced back. Picture on the right, the parish council actually did some clearance work in Grove and the river again very quickly started to rebound and what was a very straight boring channel has started to develop some of its own meanders, some of its own cover and shelter for fish, invertebrates and mammals. So it looks a lot more healthy very quickly actually which is great to see and it, it really does give you heart that uh, things can bounce back. We don't want to manage it all. We certainly don't want to overmanage it. We carry out no work at all in some sections. Uh, some people might think this needs sorting out. Um, if you're particularly worried about flood risk, it might might sort of up your heart rate a little bit. But this area is not a flood risk area, and large woody debris in the river is brilliant. It's great habitat. You might have heard heard the comment, "Fish live in trees too." This is what they mean. That cover provided by those fallen trees is just brilliant for not only the fish's food, but their shelter too from other predators. So um, 
litter picking is it's a surprisingly popular task with uh, with our volunteers it does sometimes mean you have to don your waders and get in there but it is great to get all that horrible plastic out of the river most of it's food packaging plastic bags snack papers beer bottles drinks cans all that sort of stuff but you find the odd you know teapot kettle bike steering wheel exhaust pipe uh, one thing you could consider is getting some river fly surveys done. We already heard from Kess about some of the monitoring we can do about rivers. And you can also monitor um, your invertebrates and monitor the health of them. And uh, the River Fly Partnership run a brilliant scheme. They'll train up people to be able to go out and monitor the inverts in their own rivers. If you can monitor several points along the river, uh, on a regular basis, it means that it will just pick up if you have had a pretty severe pollution incident, you will be able to pinpoint it where it took place and uh, and then the EA can uh, further investigate. So it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a warning system, um, but it does also let you get uh, a really good knowledge of what you really the supports and, and how healthy it is. The community engagement is is something that I've been very keen to to push with the project. Uh, the girls in the top picture were actually keen to do work experience with the project, so we got them involved doing some survey work. The picture below is from a um, one of the village fates, and um, we're keen to take part there alongside the local flood group. So part of what I realised when I started on the project is that we had. Uh, community up at Letcom, who have a team of volunteers at the Letcom Valley Nature Reserve, which is a Bebout Reserve, who were working on the brook. We had the Letcom Brook volunteers who worked mainly in Wantage and Grove. Then we had Honey Flood Group working down at Honey, but they were all fairly, you know, working in, in on their own patch and independently from each other. So I've worked hard to try and pull us all together and make sure we're all all sort of working towards the same aims and able to draw on each other's experience and tools and, and knowledge and, and share um, share that elbow grease around a little bit too. And community engagement is just obviously a great way to get people involved with the local river, caring about the local river and um, hopefully then keeping an eye on it for you because one thing I've certainly realised is I can't be everywhere at once, even on a, a little brook <laughs> like the Lecton Brook. Social media has been uh, a great help. So uh, we've we've set that up fairly recently. We launched a website, started using Twitter, and very recently went to Facebook. And it, it has been a very good way of um, raising the profile of the project and the importance of the brook. And um, as we all well know, pictures of nice fairy mammals always go down well. So being able to put up some pictures of otters taken on trail cameras has been uh, yeah, it's caused a real stir and, and caused an awful, awful lot of positive engagement and a few negative comments, but they got jumped on very quickly, I'm pleased to say. So we managed to tap into various bits of funding. Uh, this was some from the Wild Trout Trust and, and Thames Water, their River and Wetland Community Day. We managed to get some money to spend on the Letcombe Reserve. This was actually while I was still with Bebout. And uh, we used the money to start uh, building artificial berms to narrow the channel in places to try and increase the velocity and shift some of this silt. So uh, some of the volunteers in there, um, it's a pretty full on task, but um, we're hoping it will pay, pay dividends over time. Pitch on the right is, is another structure we built. Again, just, just to narrow and you can see where the, the lighter water there is, is starting to shift some of the silt and, um, and scour some of that silt out and move it downstream. Very recently, we've managed to complete the fish passage at Hanny, East Hanny around Lower Mill. So that's our very bottommost obstruction to fish passage. Recently, the Environment Agency and Thames Water um, got a fish passage put in at Venn Mill. So fish can now come uh, from the Thames up the River Ock, off of the Ock into the end of Childry Brook, 
up Childry Brook into Letcombe Brook. And this was their stopping point at a lower mill. They can now get past there via the, the passage, um, which is still looking very unnatural at that point. We literally finished it uh, end of October. So it was brand spanking new. And that was from funding from the Environment Agency. And we worked with a contractor called Kane Bioengineering, who I must say were, were brilliant to work with. And many thanks to the Environment Agency for the funding. Um, I acted as project manager just to try and keep the cost down. And uh, it's been a very positive experience. We've also been working on developing a catchment wide river restoration plan. It's very easy just to be opportunity based and sort of jump around here and there doing odd things, um, you know, as the opportunity comes up. But very keen to develop a strategic approach to it, uh, which is involved in and out and walk in the river as much as possible and try and identify all of the issues. And um, yeah, I mean, things like this, further blockages, um, where, is, where is all that runoff going in, in? Where's all that silt coming from? So taking some wet walks, looking at your flooding hotspots. This was in Wantage, this was just last winter. You can see there's not a lot of headspace left there going under Mill Street. And that was the water all pouring out around the mill and down the road and unfortunately straight back in the river rather than through anyone's uh, front door. A big job takes quite a lot of time, but um, I think it's well worth doing and taking that strategic approach. So you're basically trying to identify Chunk the river up into reaches that are similar and uh, just give you sort of bite-sized pieces to work on and identify the pressures and the impacts that are affecting them. And then it's a case of, uh, sort of looking at them further, trying to prioritise them, trying to come up with uh, projects that might uh, improve things and trying to cost that up. So it's, it's a, a long-term project and we're still working on that. So yeah, just a quick top tip is uh, definitely get to know your river before wading in. That's Clive from the Flood Group. He certainly knows his river very well. He spends hours in there pulling Himalayan balsam and removing obstructions. And at the Hanny end, Hanny is very liable to flooding. So the Flood Group are very active. So just some sort of hints and tips really that I hope will be useful. I'll go through them pretty quick because I'm aware this is available for people to look at later. So environment agency is your obvious starting point. Do you get in touch with your biodiversity officer for your catchment? Just, just get in touch with the EA. They'll tell you who that is. Tell them what river you, what you're talking about and you will be put in touch with that person and they are invaluable. There'll be a catchment coordinator too. And again, well worth speaking to because they'll tell you about funding that might be available, potential partners and all the rest of it. I know that EA have taken an awful lot of, slack, of, of um, flack recently uh, from the press, um, but my local team I find massively supportive and really helpful, very knowledgeable, and they've come up with some good funding for us. So do get in touch with them. Your catchment hosts, mine are the OC, I'm on the OC catchment and it's Freshwater Habitats Trust, but find out who your river catchment host is and get in touch with them. Find out what's already going on and see if you can get involved in that or provide them with some ideas for projects because sometimes that's what they're looking for. Might be a district council if it's um, an ordinary water course rather than main river. So other people that might be able to help. So you've got your wildlife trust, TVERC, your friends of groups. Uh, there might be a flood group, there might be a river warden or in more rural areas. It could be local farmers, estate managers, or even a fishing club. So it's well worth finding out a few things before you get stuck in. Um, there are rights and responsibilities, and depending on the status of your river and where it is, um, you might not be able to do certain things. And as I said in the bottom one there, to do any work to banks or the bed of the river, you almost certainly need EA permission. 
Uh, it's for good reason, obviously messing about with a river upstream, you can cause big problems further downstream. So it's well worth spending the time to talk to the right people and make sure you've taken everything into consideration. And you'll almost certainly need to apply for a flood risk um, permit, which the EA will need to assess and make sure that your work isn't going to cause a problem downstream. So what sort of projects are there? I mean, yeah, just setting up some river wardens or some surveyors, getting stuck in with teams of volunteers, doing habitat improvement, doing some of the education or engagement work, getting involved with your local schools, I think is brilliant. You know, they're going to be the future guardians, aren't they? Get them involved, get them interested. They love it more than anything. And teachers are, you know, I think desperate to, obviously tricky at the moment, but generally, if, if teachers can take the kids out on site to somewhere local and get them involved, then uh, they're very key. Possible sources of funding, there is money out there and rivers seem to be getting an increased profile at the moment, which is good. So you've got your uh, Environment Agency funding. WEEF is one of the pots, Water Environment Improvement Fund, but there are other pots for things like reducing flood risk. Um, might be the TOE, Trust for Oxfordshire's Environment, would be up for funding a biodiversity project. The water body, the, the water agencies themselves do have funding. And then there are some specialist groups too. There's River Trust now all over the UK, the Wildlife Trust. Um, you know, if, if they've got reserves on your river, might be interested, the Wild Trout Trust. We get funding from the District Council. Uh, it is reducing, but we do still get it. And we also get money from our parish and town councils too. But there are pots of money as well from Section 106 money, uh, community infrastructure levy money, new homes bonus money. So it is out there. So as the end of it, I thought I'd better rush through the end just so we got a little bit of time for questions. So um, please fire away if people have got questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. You've, you've done a fantastic job on that, Brooke. Um, but obviously, you've got still a lot more to, to get <laughs> stuck into. Yeah. Um, Adele, would you like to start with your question? Hi. Um, sorry, I'm just reminding myself what I asked, because um, I've got so many questions, Mark. That was just <laughs> utterly brilliant, really inspirational. So thank you. Um, uh, I was just curious to know what the public response is to um, this of a, this of the question of removing bridges or removing mini weirs that people, I guess, tend to sort of like, uh, you know, they're automatically attracted to the sort of like the aesthetic, um, uh, you know, the aesthetic appeal of, you know, the tumbling water or whatever. Just wonder how you find that goes down when you talk to people. Yeah, it is a challenge one. People do get attached to their waterfalls. And nearly everybody has said, oh, you know, but I really like that sound of running water. But trying to explain that you can you can make gaps in that structure, you can get fish passage and still have that sound of running water. You know, you don't ideally removal of the whole thing is the best solution because you remove the impoundment and all the other issues with it. But at least if you can get fish passage through it. Uh, you know, you're part way there, and and that's the middle ground that we usually aim to, you know, to achieve. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll talk more about your other questions. Uh, yes. So, Anne Cotton, would you like to put yours forward? Hi. Yeah, I was just wondering um, when you approach landowners and you have to go and give them the message that their section of the river is not in very good condition how how do you do that tactfully and how do they tend to take it um mixed <laughs> i mean often it's i think i think some people don't know what to do for the best um which i totally understand um you know things like water voles you know, people, people don't know whether they can just, you know, get in and clear some debris or, or, or cut the banks back, whether that's a good thing to do or a bad thing to do. So um, generally, people are 
uh, positively receive the fact that you're prepared to come and give some free independent advice. And, uh, you know, we try and act as a, a sort of independent person on the ground that's local. We're not an enforcement body. Obviously, I do, do work with the Environment Agency, but um, we are independent and we're local and we can give that advice freely, which um, is usually well taken up. Does that okay. answer? That's, yeah. that's good to know. Thanks. So I think usually once we can provide some some detailed advice, you know, based based on our knowledge as to what is good for the river, um, people have generally been happy for that work to take place. And sometimes it is down to a, a lack of funding. You know, they haven't got the money to get uh, some large willow pollards dealt with. So sometimes we can actually find some funding to help them get that work completed too, which you know again usually goes down very well. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Caroline Hunt, would you like to put your question? I know Mark's actually covered quite a lot of this, but having listened to him, you might find that you've got some more questions that lead on from it now uh, to point you in the right direction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. That is amazing how much you've done. I'm, I'm hoping that's at least 10 or 15 years worth of work to make us all feel better. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, I should have said the project was set up in 2003 and I can't take credit for most of the work because it was Sally Wallington who was the project officer for 14 years. Uh, I only started in May, May 2018. But it's, it is fantastic, the amount that's been done. Um, very inspiring. So my question was, as a complete newbie, how, how to start out? But as Anne said, you have pretty much helpfully given me, given me pretty much all I need to know. Um, so I just need to, to maybe get a, a copy afterwards of the overheads and, and read through and start thinking. Well, one thing that does strike me of the many questions that are gonna come up is whose responsibility is the river when it runs past a field on one side, footpath on the other, and again, private land on the other side of the footpath. Any ideas who to approach first? Yeah, I mean, usually, usually if a river is a boundary, uh, the responsibility lies down the midline of the channel. So the landowner on, on each side will have a responsibility for their bank. There okay. are exceptions to that. It's not always the case, but that is the general rule. Okay. Gosh, that, that makes it more interesting. <laughs> yeah, it does for sure. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure I could ask you lots more, but I will get out of the way for the next person. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. So I can't see any more questions. So I don't know whether anyone wants to um, just have a general discussion or whether everyone's <laughs> come to the end of their, <laughs> of their uh, uh, concentration levels and wants to go and have a cup of tea or something. So um, I don't know, Roselle, what helpful would you like? Is there one more thing I can just mention actually that I didn't during the main bit? Um, I, I thanked the volunteers, but we also rely very heavily on, uh, on volunteer trustees um, that sit in a steering group for us and um, you know, re rely very heavily on, on that approach that the steering group is made up of, of, uh, of volunteers and funders and somebody from the EA does come along to that too. Uh, and that's, that's you know, an invaluable part of the process. Uh, I'm out there sort of trying to deliver and, and coming up with a lot of the ideas, but I need to be at a sense, check that with other people. And, uh, you know, people are acting as fundraisers and, and secretaries and all the rest of it. So getting a bit of a team around you to start with will certainly make things a lot easier. Okay. That's great. We've just got one more question from Ann Miller. Hi, Ann. Um, would you like to <laughs> Would you like to ask your question to Mark? Sure, Mark. I, thank you for that wonderful presentation. It was really, really good, really inspiring. Um, just curious. You you had all these people out with their saws doing all sorts of things in the river, and immediately one worries about the risks. And you referred to having done risk assessment training with Bebout. Um, and I just wondered, for those of us setting things up um, and taking things forward, you know, 
how do we make sure that uh, we do that risk assessment appropriately and who in the end is liable? Um, if somebody falls in or the, the water goes over the top of the waders, um, <laughs> where, does it, where does it lie? It happens. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It's an important one. Um, it is a little bit confusing in terms of the Health and Safety Act in that that covers employees, um, but people have their own responsibility to, to, to work in a, in a safe way and to assess and consider what they're doing in terms of safety to themselves and, and passers by. Um, but as um, we're, we're set up now as a charity, and if people are volunteering from us, you know, I very much feel that I have a responsibility for their self, health and safety too. And, that, and that's why I've adopted that health and safety approach. And you'll find that a lot of insurance companies too will ask and specify that you, you have to do risk assessments. I'm very happy to share any of the information that, that we have. Uh, I'm sure BVAT would be as well. No point reinventing the wheel. So if we can share risk assessments that we have, um, you know, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, people like um, you know Oxford Conservation Volunteers or uh, British Trust for Conservation or BCV, I think they are now. There's lots of organisations that have, that have done all, all this sort of work too that you could tap into and I'm sure share that sort of information. Is that helpful? Very helpful. Thank you. If there's something that we can sort of have generically that we can all use to work from, I think that would be hugely helpful. Yeah, I mean, they do need to be, you know, a little bit site specific and, and sort of updated on the day. You know, they need to be a little bit dynamic. But the main sort of issues you can, you know, you can certainly share and adapt. Great. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was really, really inspiring. And I, I hope that's um, been helpful to people. Adele, last, last week, Adele mentioned... Um, you know, that Benson Nature Group have, have really focused on their parish um, and the work that they've been doing in the last few years, but that they're going to start to look up and look out and start to engage with their neighbouring parishes. And one of the most obvious um, opportunities there would be to engage with UL next door, upstream of, of another short uh, strand of chalk stream, but there's only UL, there's Benson, and then it reaches the, the Thames. So, you know, you've got two parishes there, two villages uh, with the chalk stream um, that, that emerges from the ground at UL. Um, so one would hope that between the two of them, they could they could do the very, very best for that for that chalk stream. Um, yeah. So, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, next week, next Wednesday, we've got our very own Mike Pollard talking about um, the Nature Recovery Network. Um, that has been developed uh, in partnership with um, the Thames Valley Environmental Records Centre, Wild Oxfordshire and BBOUT, but also with the Biodiversity Advisory Group um, overseeing that, uh, and followed by um, Katrina Bass from Encham's Nature Recovery Network, who is going to talk about her amazing journey from... Um, managing a, a meadow for wildlife, um, engaging with her neighbours, uh, and then suddenly this sort of this explosion of interest in the work that she's been doing. Um, uh, and that will be, so if you're not booked onto that and you're interested, do so. Um, I, I try and close the event right thing 24 hours before um, the event. So thank you, Kez, and thank you, Mark, um, for brilliant inspirational talks. We have recorded this. The light is flashing. I will endeavour to get it up onto the website as soon as I can if you want to watch it again. Um, and uh, thank you, Anne, for fielding questions so gamely. You're welcome. Um, can, I, can I just bring one last question from Mark Hanger? He's just put a, a, oh. a late question in. Mark, do you want to quickly say it? I didn't see that. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just I was just interested in the the sort of future work. Obviously, a lot of good work done um, historically and, and continues to be done on the actual river. But you, you you mentioned about your you're looking at the sort of catchment area as well. So I just wondered what your sort of next next plans were and and, and whether you could just expand on on what you're sort of looking to do going forward. 
Yeah, um, so basically we're trying to continue with the removal of obstructions to, to fish passage, uh, not particularly because, well, we are partly prioritising fish because that was one of the reasons the brook fails the water framework directive. So improving passages is, is an important thing, but just also to help restore the natural functioning of the river. So we're, we're basically working upstream from the bottom end. So we've got a lot more, a lot more obstructions to remove. Uh, and at the same time, continuing to work on the, um, basically the habitat management, improving habitat for, for all the species um, and maybe particularly for water vole, I suppose you could say, but if it's good habitat for water vole, it tends to be good habitat for everything. So I think that's a, a fair stance. And then we, we hope to uh, increase our education offer. We'd love to be able to offer a, um, a trout in the classroom package, uh, which some other organizations already provide. There's, there's so many opportunities, there, there's so much to do. So it's just a case of securing funding and, and finding the time to deliver it um, and targeting landowners, you know, this issue with agriculture and runoff. Um, and trying to encourage good land management because obviously the river is just heavily impacted by everything that happens on its banks. Great, thanks for that. Thank you.